protecting our precious eyesight, we take a look at glaucoma and eye care tonight on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. If someone takes a swing and tries to punch us in the eye, we know it's coming and try to duck away and avoid the injury right away. But what if the punch was infinitely slow, sort of invisible, so we didn't notice it was coming? If it took years for the bruise to show up, the injury to our sight would be just as severe, but we would not have the clue to move out of the way. Glaucoma is that slow punch that we may not notice until it's too late. We'll be exploring the causes and treatments for glaucoma tonight. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. Pick the best answer. With glaucoma, A, central vision is diminished. B, peripheral vision is diminished. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays originally written for this show comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you get 10 minutes for the quiz question to get your answer in. But we answer your medical questions about glaucoma all night. It's causes and prevention as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight from Vance Thompson Vision in Sioux Falls is John, Dr. John Birdall. Thank you for joining us, John. It's really fun to be here. What is really the most common question that you get asked as they come to you with a glaucoma problem? Well, the first thing that people want to know is, are they going to go blind? And that's, that's scary. There's a recent study that came out at Johns Hopkins that said people are uh, most scared of going blind, number two scared of dementia, and number three scared of death. And so it, it's... So it's, it's a, blind is worse. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Then death and that's dementia. That's right. That's right. Wow. And so, so the bad news is that glaucoma is the second leading cause of blindness in the world, and it's the leading cause of irreversible blindness. The good news is that very few people that have glaucoma actually go blind from it, and it's almost always preventable from, from getting to that stage where you can't see anymore. So the, the, the issue is diagnosing it early enough. That's right. So, okay, so I'm a guy going down the street and I don't even know that I'm getting this problem I mean do do I have a clue or do I just have to just get regular checkups the real problem with glaucoma is you don't have a clue until it's affecting your life and we can't undo the damage that occurs already so glaucoma is probably the biggest reason why you need to get an annual eye exam when you're kind of over 40 years old with your regular eye doctor whether that's an optometrist or an ophthalmologist you need to be getting an eye exam uh, at least every couple of years, but ideally every year. Right. Uh, and so, but who are the highest risk for glaucoma? Yeah. I mean, people with glasses, or uh, people who have astigmatism, or is it people who've had trauma to their eyes, or is it because family history, or yep. I mean, what what is it that gives yep. puts you at higher risk? Family history is a big risk factor for glaucoma. And so if you have a person in your family that has glaucoma, especially somebody that went blind from glaucoma, you may have an aggressive form of glaucoma and you need to be more diligent about getting checked. Uh, that's a yearly check then. Yeah, that's right. African Americans are at much higher risk for glaucoma, eight times higher risk than Caucasians for why, glaucoma. Why, why in the you world You know, it's that? probably genetic. Um, and, and they get, uh, have a tendency to get a high eye pressure glaucoma and, and get it maybe at a little bit younger of an age. And it's harder to treat, too, because um, the healing response is more robust. And then trauma. Anything that damages the outflow pathway of fluid in your eye can cause your eye pressure to go up, and that can lead to glaucoma. So if you've had some trauma to your eye yeah. at one time, yep. scar tissues can occur, and then that might obstruct the you flow out. <clears throat> Let's talk about what it is. Uh, what is glaucoma? We, it's a fancy name. We know it's causing blindness. We know it runs in families. 
So why does it occur? I mean, you talked about high pressures. Mm -hmm. So I presume that we're going to talk about high pressures, but that's not the whole story, is it? Yeah, so the real answer to your question of what is glaucoma is that we don't know. It's the second leading cause. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know what really glaucoma is. We do know that high eye pressure matters in glaucoma. And about 80% of people with glaucoma have high eye pressures. Now, is it in the central part? Yep. Here's a picture. Is yep. it in the drop picture? Yeah, right. Is it in the central part of the so pressure? Or where? Pressure inside the eye. Any, anywhere, touch any, hard. anywhere here inside the eye puts pressure on the optic nerve back here and that can lead to glaucoma. Okay. But 20% of people don't have high eye pressures in the United States that have glaucoma. And in Japan, 70% of people that have glaucoma don't have a high eye pressure. So clearly high, high eye pressure isn't the entire story. And so, um, so actually, you know, I'm, I'm kinda a, a little nerdy. <laughs> And when I was on vacation, when I was a resident with my wife, we were scuba diving. And I thought, golly, at just 30 feet of depth when you're scuba diving, you had 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure to our eye. And I'll do glaucoma surgery on somebody when their eye pressure is elevated 20 millimeters of mercury. And I thought, how is it possible that we can scuba dive and not get this disease? And so instead of enjoying my vacation, <laughs> I spent my time thinking about this and came to believe that glaucoma is not just a one pressure disease, the eye pressure, but it's really a balance between the pressure here inside the eye and the pressure here, which is your cerebral spinal fluid pressure that bathes your optic nerve as, as it enters the back of the eye. So it's a balance. So it's a pressure balance. So if the pressure is high in the back, pressure in the front equals it's not going to destroy that. You got it. So if the pressure here is high or the pressure back here is low, you get a pressure differential right here across your optic nerve head. That causes your optic nerve to bow backwards. We call that cupping in glaucoma. Mm -hmm. And it stops the optic nerve from being able to get the nutrients it needs and the disease slowly progresses and you slowly lose your peripheral vision and ultimately can lose all your vision. So peripheral vision, what would that, uh, let's explain what central vision and peripheral vision is. Yeah, so peripheral vision is how far out here can you see your fingers wiggling? Yep. And, um, it, and it doesn't just go black. It, we all have a blind spot. So if you closed one eye and moved the tip of your finger over, you'd find your blind spot. That's totally normal. But it's not a black spot there. You never notice it. Right, right. You don't. It just, your brain fills in the information. Yeah. One of the fascinating things that I learned uh, when I was learning about vision is that your brain is an incredibly efficient image processor. If you look at a black circle with a white background, the only place that your brain fires is the interface where the black meets the white and it fills in everything else like it's black and everything on the outside like it's white. That's why in glaucoma or in your blind spot, um, you don't see anything. It just processes it like there's no change and right. you don't notice it and you can't notice it. So it, it can, it's sneaky because your brain tries to fill in. It, uh, it is. And so where you see a problem sometimes is when you hit your shoulder on a door jam. Right, so let's, tell me yeah, about great. that picture. Yeah, so you don't know that that world on the outside is constricting until you start to walk through a door and you kind of hit your shoulder or you didn't see that car in the passing lane. And so all of that outside vision starts to go away and you can still see your central vision. All right, so that's glaucoma and, uh, and the people from Japan 70% of those have normal pressure. They have normal pressure. But they have low pressure in, probably in their CSF. You got it. Uh, and I know that there's an interesting thing in internal medicine. We have normal pressure hydrocephalus where people have these expanded lakes within the brain. Yep. And you think, well, that's because there's a blockage and there's huge pressures pushing it out. And, and the answer is no. Yeah. But we, it's kind of one of those unknown, not well known. And, and, but you drain it. And it, it gets better. It gets better. Dramatically. And one of the things that's interesting is that sometimes there's been reports when people have that fluid drained that they get glaucoma because they've lowered their CSF pressure, the pressure oh, really? of the brain. Yes. And now they're at risk for glaucoma. Oh, so it needs you need to have this balance. Uh, 
So they have normal pressure hydrocephalus. You put in a drain, you lower the pressure to help the brain, and these people get glaucoma. Yep, it was one of the first wow. papers that came out after our original paper <laughs> yeah. showing that CSF pressure mattered. Well, we want to make sure that people know to call in. So uh, please make an effort to, to go to the internet or give us a call so that, because it's your questions that makes the difference. So let's start with the most basic question, what is glaucoma? And we've kind of answered that. Uh, I know firsthand that glaucoma, I, I know that glaucoma firsthand is a problem because I've had it, and I had it as a result, I think, after they did a vitrectomy. Mm -hmm. My primary care ophthalmologist sent me to have a vitrectomy because I was having some problems, which is that ball, that central part of yep. the brain was, or the eye was removed and subsequently I started getting glaucoma. Yep. Some of that was because they were giving me steroid drops to, to solve the complication of the first problem. Uh, so I have lived with glaucoma. But one of the things that they did to fix it was to burn the outer limbus of yeah. this. So let's, let's explain this. Yeah, you bet. So the fluid in your eye is made here. It's called the ciliary body. Make that big mark really big, okay. And then that fluid flows through your eye and then it comes out and it drains through a structure called the trabecular meshwork. And that's like a sieve. And if that sieve is too blocked up, then with scar tissue or debris or whatever, then the fluid doesn't flow out. It's kind of like leaves in a drain. And what you had was probably an SLT laser. And what that does is it causes that tissue to remodel, open up, and now the fluid can flow through better. So right. even though glaucoma is a two pressure disease probably, the only treatment we have is to try and lower eye pressure. All right. So I was fortunate to have some great docs to help me through this treatment. Let's show this. Those of us in the field would consider glaucoma an optic neuropathy, meaning there's something wrong with the optic nerve. Uh, most people would associate glaucoma with eye pressure, and that is a risk factor for glaucoma. Uh, but the end step in glaucoma is damage to the optic nerve. The optic nerve is the main nerve, I think of it uh, as a fiber optic cable, that takes all the information from the eye and delivers it to the brain. So each eye has one optic nerve, and as that optic nerve is damaged by glaucoma, you lose nerve fibers. Uh, we are born with roughly 1.2 million nerve fibers in each eye. We will lose some of those as part of the normal aging process, but with glaucoma you lose those in an accelerated manner, and that will generally start to cause peripheral vision loss. However, sometimes the vision loss is central and it's much more noticeable by the patient. Uh, it's a dangerous condition because it's common and it does not have prominent symptoms. Uh, you do not know if your eye pressure is high. In fact, the eye pressure can become quite high and someone would never know. And the vision loss that people have with glaucoma is very subtle and it comes on slowly. And so there can be significant loss of peripheral vision in somebody that has had glaucoma for a long time and they're not aware of it at all. Elevated intraocular pressure is the biggest risk factor. Uh, family history and age are also significant risk factors along with nearsightedness. Uh, in many people it's just genetic and they're going to get glaucoma one way or the other. There's no way they can avoid it. And at a certain age, uh, your years on this earth and genetics will catch up to you and the manifestations of glaucoma will begin. There's other conditions that can cause it. Trauma to an eye uh, could cause glaucoma. Uh, patients with bad diabetic eye disease can end up with glaucoma. Uh, there's also exogenous uh, means of getting glaucoma such as steroids, people that are on prednisone or even steroid drops can get something called steroid induced glaucoma. Those people that have what we call primary open angle glaucoma, uh, the hereditary type, uh, there's really no way of avoiding it. The goal would be to identify it early, treat it early, and try to minimize the damage that it has on the eyes. Uh, checking the eye pressure is very important. Getting a good history, family history. If you say I have several people in my family that have struggled with glaucoma over the years, that's very important. 
And then the exam with peripheral vision checks, that is a computerized test that we do. Uh, there's also analysis of the optic nerve. The thickness of the optic nerve is very important and we can analyze that using a machine that is much like a CAT scan. So it's essentially a CAT scan of your eye measuring the thickness of that retinal nerve fiber layer which becomes the optic nerve. Thank you, Dr. Osmondson. This is a very interesting topic, this I idea of glaucoma. I've never been so interested until I got it. <laughs> and then suddenly, ooh, this is interesting. It becomes real. He, uh, let's talk again about the kinds of treatment that you can do for glaucoma. Mostly it's going to be medicine, isn't it? Yeah, so there's medical, laser, and surgical options. And so the only thing that we can do to treat glaucoma is try and get the eye pressure down, or at least that's all we can do for now. And so usually the first step in that is a medication, and it's usually an eye drop that you take once a night, and if your glaucoma still isn't controlled, then we maybe add additional medications. Like Greg talked about, laser is an option for glaucoma, and then you can move into more surgical options. And it used to be that we had to do either a trabeculectomy or a tube shunt to really get the pressure down inside the eye. But these surgeries, um, they carry more risk than we'd like. The, the failure rate for trabeculectomies at five years is about 50%. And it- uh, So the pressures come back up. The then. pressures come back up, the glaucoma gets worse. Now, or trabeculectomy means that you cut away those little that sieves that are That's outside. right, basically you put a hole inside the eye that communicates around behind the eye and that fluid drains through there, but if it scars down, that pressure can go up. And, and, it, and it's a risky surgery. It's one we need sometimes, and we do um, when the benefits outweigh the risks. Yeah. But there's this huge gap between medications and lasers and this, and that's where a new category of treatment called microinvasive glaucoma surgery has emerged. And this has really only emerged over the last four years, and the first device of that was a, was a device called the Glaucose Eye Stent. And, um, and, and that's this device here on the screen. Um, you can see it here, and, and, as, and it's right here. And that is the smallest device ever implanted into humans. It's about one millimeter long. It can fit into the ridge of a fingerprint. And we put that um, in that drainage area, the trabecular meshwork that we talked about before. And if you think about leaves over a drain like we talked about that's clogging up a drain, mm -hmm. this is like putting a little PVC pipe right in the middle of it so the fluid can throw, flow through unobstructed. And the great thing about it, it doesn't get pressured down quite as low as a trabeculectomy or a tube shunt would, but it is incredibly safe. It's about as safe as cataract surgery. And we do it most of the time at the same time as cataract surgery. Now the other thing that's interesting is cataract surgery by itself can lower your eye pressure. So if you've got really mild glaucoma, just taking that cataract out can open up your drainage pathway and lower your pressure too. Does, it, uh, does cataract surgery ever cause glaucoma or eye surgery ever cause glaucoma? Yeah, cataract surgery can, cla can cause glaucoma. Um, Sometimes it's because of the steroid uh, afterwards, and the steroid can cause the eye pressure to go up. Sometimes it can incite some inflammation that can cause the eye pressure to go up. Um, and, and we put a gel inside the eye, and sometimes people's eye pressure is just higher after cataract surgery, and we don't know why. Okay. So uh, we have another role in about t kinds of treatment from Dr. Osmondson. Let's just look at that right now. Think of your eye as a sink. You have a faucet and you have a drain, okay? We can use medications that turn the faucet down. We also have medications that can open the drain up. And so we frequently will do both. The most successful treatment that we have is something that is called a prostaglandin analog. And that helps open the drain up. So the fluid escapes more readily into the venous system and the pressure goes down. But the, so this trabeculum, uh, is also called the trabecular meshwork where the fluid drains through this. It's kind of like a sponge with little pores where the fluid uh, escapes. And we use something called a cold laser, which is uh, termed a selective laser trabeculoplasty. And by selective, it means it treats just the tissue that we want it to treat and doesn't cause any secondary scarring. What we're trying to do is clean up 
the pores of the trabecular meshwork so the fluid drains more efficiently. Uh, the laser is used in ophthalmology in numerous different uh, regards and in, in medicine in general, but it's not a cure-all. It doesn't get you off all the drops and cure you from glaucoma, uh, but it is something that is an adjunct to the medical treatment. Now, frequently patients will go beyond medication and beyond laser and their pressure is still not controlled. So if you're on maximum tolerated medicines, that might be two or three medicines, and have had laser, uh, and you're still getting worse with elevated pressures and the visual field is progressing and the optic nerve is showing more damage, we frequently will discuss our surgical options in the operating room. Some of these procedures are done at the same time as cataract surgery and it can be very convenient. The same incision can be used. Recovery time is very similar to a straightforward cataract surgery. Those patients uh, generally will show a drop in their eye pressure. Uh, not as significant of a drop as some people might need, so if we don't feel like that's going to get the patient's pressure low enough, we'll move on to what we call a filtering procedure where we're actually making a separate drain. What we're saying is uh, we can't rehabilitate the, your native drain. The pressure won't go low enough. We're going to have to make a separate drain. And we do that kind of underneath the upper lid along the junction of the cornea and the sclera, which is kind of the clear part and the white part, right about the 12 o'clock. And what we'll do is after the eye is nice and numb and everything's cleaned up, uh, we will kind of tunnel our way into the eye, creating a passageway for the fluid to go from inside the eye to outside. Sometimes we'll actually place a little tube. It's a little plastic or silicone tube that we place kind of between the eye muscles of the eye, and we run a little tube into the eye where the fluid is brought back to the reservoir, and that's where the fluid is dispersed. So uh, you and I, off camera, we're talking a little bit about the opposite of glaucoma, which happens with space, people in space. T tell me a little bit about what that yeah, is. Yeah, you about. bet. So as we've come to believe that glaucoma may be a two-pressure disease where the eye pressure is higher than the brain pressure or the CSF right. pressure, the opposite can happen, where the brain pressure gets higher than the eye pressure. We see that in a condition called pseudotumor cerebri. Um, and, and what we see is swelling of the optic nerve. Well, it turns out that this affects astronauts, too. And the reason why is because as you and I are sitting here, the fluid that bathes our brain also bathes our spinal cord, and it drains down into our spinal cord, so the pressure of that fluid at our eye level is lower. So normal is that the, the brain pressure is a little lower than eye pressure. It, gravity. Gravity's pull, pulling this one pressure. down, right? Yeah. Well, your eye pressure stays the same. Now, if you go up into space and there's no gravity, that brain fluid redistributes around your brain and it becomes higher. And that causes the optic nerve to bow forward and you get a condition called papilledema. And this is affecting about 50% of astronauts and we never saw it on the space shuttle missions. We only saw it when they were up for six months or, or wow. sometimes longer on the International Space Station because there wasn't enough time to cause the problem. So this is a big concern to NASA. It's their number one health concern. And with all the talk about getting people to Mars, they need to be able to see yeah. on the so, way there and while they're there. So how did you get involved? Yeah, so, um, you know, because of the idea that glaucoma is a two-pressure disease, they. Uh, NASA went to work with some doctors on this Vision for Mars team to solve this problem and they had seen some of my research and talked to some colleagues and invited me to be one of five ophthalmologists working with uh, them to help solve this problem. So show me, let's, let's yeah. show them yeah. this. Now explain so, that story. Yeah, so uh, I got invited down to Houston and to, to go and meet with astronauts and the team at NASA and the NSBRI and our, our gift that they gave us was a number of signed astronaut flight patches. And I'll tell you what, I was like a kid in a candy store, a small <laughs> town kid from South Dakota, and I got to go down, and these folks are just incredible. And we think, um, and, and because of our research, we think we've got some understanding of what's causing it, and, and we actually started a little medical device company, and we think that we've got a treatment for the astronauts while they're up there, and our device may end up on the International Space Station, and a device that can also help treat glaucoma. Bringing the pressure up in the eye? So what we would do in space is we'd bring the pressure up 
to balance the pressure in the brain and equalize those pressures, whereas the treatment for glaucoma would be to bring the pressure down to balance it. And the key is just balance. Wow. Well, we've got a bunch of questions, so I'm going to yeah, jump great. into Let's those, do it. John. Uh, email question, 65-year-old woman, my doctor says I have pre-glaucoma. I'm taking restasis drops now. Will that help evade glaucoma? Restasis doesn't help glaucoma. Restasis is for dry eye. What he means or she means by pre-glaucoma is maybe there's a couple of parameters that don't look quite right. And, and really, I look at six things when I look at glaucoma. I look at your eye pressure. I look at your optic nerve. I look at your OCT, I look at your visual field, I look at your corneal thickness, and I look at your uh, family history or, or eye pressure. I can't remember which one right. I didn't say. Okay, what is OCT? OCT is kind of like a little CT scan of your retina, and if it looks too thin, then you've had some damage from glaucoma. Okay. And so I suspect that her doctor says, one of, the, one of these two or two of these of these six things doesn't look quite right, let's watch you close. All right, uh, that's interesting. A man, would, would you treat aggressively? Would you start them on drops that yeah. early? Uh, this is a, a place where you need to know your patient. If the patient is a person that's really conservative and says, you know, I buckle up and put the roll cage down and make sure the airbags are working, then maybe we treat. If it was me and if it was my eye, I'd say let's just watch it closely. Okay. Man from Yankton, I've been told by my doctor that I need to repeat my visual field test. Is this related to glaucoma or is this something completely different? Also, is there uh, been any improvement in medical equipment used to conduct a visual field test? So what is a visual field test and how does it help with glaucoma? A visual field test is when you look straight ahead into kind of this white bowl and a light comes on and you push a button if you see the light or not. And that's what a visual field test is. So if, you were, if, if that's what you're pointing at and they do lights over here and here and here and, and here. And then if you didn't see, if they shined a light and you didn't see it, um, you didn't push the button, that's a visual field defect. But that machine is tricky and nobody likes visual fields because sometimes it won't show you a light and then you push the button. So it's trying to trick you. Yeah. And, um, and so yes, to answer the question, the visual field test is repeated to make sure that that visual field isn't getting worse. And yes, it is related to glaucoma. Now the astute question that he said is, has there been any technology improvement in visual fields? Yeah. And the answer pretty much no. <laughs> no. It's, it's been the same It's still a test. kind of a crappy test. It, it, yeah, it is no fun, and, um, but, it's, but it is a test of function, and it works, and it's important. And um, once you're diagnosed with glaucoma, you're going to get that test you know, every year or two. And if it's severe glaucoma, maybe every few months. Okay. Uh, I am, and I have to say that, I, that visual field was the first thing that was wrong with me. Yeah. And I noticed it, and they went, oh, hmm, not quite as well as you did before. Wow. Ooh. Yeah. I'm 65, female. I have dry eyes. Does that aggravate glaucoma? I'm taking root stasis drops, uh, wetting drops. I'm nearsighted. I have allergies. I take allergy drops, too. Is there anything else I can do? So this is a person who has dry eyes, is taking eye drops, you know, lubricating drops, and allergy medicines. The first thing I think of is allergy medicine making her eyes dry. Yep. And what else do you think? Allergy medications can make your eye dry, um, but not related to glaucoma. However, if you take oral allergy medications, they're going to say, if you have glaucoma, don't take it. Unfortunately, Why is that? They, because it's an antihistamine and they're afraid that it'll change the pupil relationship and close off the outflow. But Explain that, is, that. A yeah. wide pupil, small pupil, which is better either, for glaucoma? Either can. If the, if the pupil gets too big and it crowds up the trabecular meshwork and blocks it up, that can cause a problem. If the pupil's too small, then it can touch your lens and fluid can't get around it. But the good news is if you've got open angle glaucoma, which is 90 plus percent of glaucoma in the United States, you don't have to worry about this. It's only for closed angle glaucoma, and that's really pretty uncommon, so you can still take your allergy Would it be pills. worth explaining open or yeah, closed you angle glaucoma? Show me. What you bet. So it, now my drawing is on display here, but imagine this is your eye, and here's your lens. The fluid is made back here, and it comes around into the drainage pathway. And so the rest, the rest of the eye, is, of course, is out here. That's right. I yep. mean, this is the rest. You bet. Of well, at least my drawing was better than yours. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so here's the rest of the eye. Not much better. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, if the angle is open and the fluid can get to it, 
that's called open angle glaucoma, and that's really where there's leaves in the drain. Right. Now, if the iris, the colored part of your eye, bows forward like this, and it's preventing that fluid from accessing the drain, that's called closed angle glaucoma. And that's you know really uncommon here in the United States. Uh, and if you go into acute angle closure glaucoma, you have a ton of pain in your eye, your pressure goes really high, that's really a medical emergency and you need to see an eye doctor quick. All right, that's good. Uh, uh, in addition to trauma to the eye, can trauma to the head result in internal swelling and pressure cause increased pressure in the eye leading to glaucoma? So head trauma. Head trauma usually doesn't lead to glaucoma. It could lead to brain damage that has a visual field defect okay. that looks like glaucoma, but it's probably not. Okay. The trauma that generally brings glaucoma, trauma to the eye, uh, is what kind of trauma? Yeah, so it's usually kind of like what you said. It's that punch to the eye. Usually it's something like a um, softball or a tennis ball or uh, what's really eyeball killers are bungee cords because you strap a bungee cord around here and then you grab it and you pull right towards your face and it releases and it, it snaps you in the eye. And it causes... Really? Yeah, they are, I, bungee cords are eyeball killers. Maybe we should, we should make a point about bungee, no bungee cords That's or true. careful, uh, wear protective lenses. When four, four things, hunting, wear eye protection. Paintball, wear eye protection. Oh wow, paintball. Fireworks wear eye protection, right. bungee cords, wear eye protection. <laughs> if you cover those four, you're gonna be fine from a trauma standpoint. Wow. Say them again because yeah. they can, these people need to hear yeah, right. these four, all right? Bungee cords, hunting, um, fireworks, and paintball. Okay. Uh, 81 year old woman from Yankton, she has glaucoma as did her mother and her grandfather. Her two brothers are not affected. She's wondering if it is more predominant in females than in males. Um, actually, it is a little bit more common in females, especially slender females. And the reason probably is because uh, bigger folks have a little bit higher CSF pressure or brain pressure. Oh. And so, um, so there's actually a study out of Harvard that shows that um, obese women are less likely to develop glaucoma even if they have a higher eye pressure. So it's maybe the only disease that cheeseburgers help. All right, a cheeseburger in heaven or in paradise. 64-year-old <laughs> woman from Washington Springs, I had read that people with glaucoma years ago would take pills with marijuana in them. Is this true and can dogs get glaucoma? So there's two questions. One is marijuana mm -hmm. in the treatment of glaucoma. And the second has to do with dogs and glaucoma. Yeah. Let's do the marijuana question. Yeah, great. Both marijuana and alcohol can lower your eye pressure, but it only does it temporarily. And so it's not really an effective treatment for glaucoma because it's so short-lived, the eye you pressure reduction. You have to be reduction. hammered from either one of those drugs for Yeah, I, I guess if you were a really chronic user, you might be benefited. <laughs> you might benefit, but you're it's a temporary. Treatment. You're going to cause other problems. All right. And, and yes, dogs can get glaucoma. So and more often, or is there a reason? Uh, particular types of dogs in general, um, I'm far from a veterinary ophthalmology expert, but pugs uh, can get glaucoma because their eyes can come forward a little bit and the eyelids can put pressure on it and the pressure can go up. So it's their buggy eyes. And you got it. You know, I want to make sure that people know that they can ask questions about any eye disease uh, here. We don't have to talk about glaucoma, so give us a call. and. Uh, Telephone number will be on your your um, your screen. Fifty-nine year old man from Goodwin, wondering how often a person should have their eyes checked. Is once a year good enough? Mother had glaucoma and he's starting to show signs. Well, yeah. that guy in particular, wouldn't you yeah. say? Yeah. So at least once a year. And if you've got real glaucoma. Um, especially a new diagnosis, we may watch it a little closer at first, but if we show that it's stable, stretch it out to about a year. But if you're over age 40, you really should probably be getting an exam at least every two years, but probably every year with your eye doctor. All right. 81-year-old woman from Sioux Center, Iowa, had a surgery for a wrinkle behind the retina last summer. We'll talk about that. Still experiencing wrinkles when looking in the distance and is still not able to read. What should she be doing next to improve on this? So why would a patient have wrinkles in their vision? 
She most likely had something called an epiretinal membrane. It's like a piece of saran wrap on the top of your retina. So the retina is kind of like the film. Okay, now hold it up so this camera can see it. Great. So the retina is back here, and the eye is like a camera. Light comes in through the cornea. Right, hold it up a little higher. OK. OK. The eye's like a camera. Light comes the, in. The lens just fell out. That's right. That doesn't happen to me in surgery. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, light comes in through the cornea and it's focused by the cornea and the lens on the retina and the retina is like a film. Right. And on that film, on the retina, a little membrane can grow called an epiretinal membrane. And retina surgeons can peel that off and that can help make the wrinkles go away, but oftentimes, sometimes, they don't. And you should get checked by your eye doctor to make sure that there's not any swelling back here that could potentially be treated with medication. So why does that little epiretinal membrane grow? You know, What causes that? Yeah, so we don't know. <laughs> I, I wish that we did, but it can be caused by trauma. It can be caused when the gel on the back of the eye um, starts to separate. That's called a posterior vitreous detachment. Right. Um, but a lot of times we don't know why it and that comes. Right. And uh, let's talk about that uh, particular uh, thing that happens. Somewhere around 60 years of age or so, people have a separation of the, yeah. of the uh, vitreous. You bet. The, so the gel in the back part of the eye is called the vitreous, right? Okay. right back here. So this is a big sack of fluid. It's a big sack of fluid, and that fluid is more like, um, like a gel than it is really a, a watery fluid. And think of it kind of like uh, loose jello. Right. Okay? And as we get older, uh, that gel has a tendency to collapse on itself. And when it collapses on itself, it pulls away from your retina. And it can cause a retinal detachment when that happens, uncommonly, but it can. And so if you have a bunch of flashes and a bunch of floaters, you should get seen by your eye doctor. Right away. Right away. Okay. Um, and and what it but most of the time it doesn't cause a retinal detachment but if it does you want to get it checked out right away okay now what happens when it condenses on itself is that it can have little areas that aren't totally clear kind of like sticking a fork in jello so if you stuck a fork in jello and shined a flashlight through it those little areas where, where, the cast, fork. where the fork was will cast a shadow and what you're seeing as floaters back there are really shadows from the condensation of the gel in the back of your eye. Now that happens to everybody? It doesn't happen to everybody, but 70% of people by age 70 will have had this posterior vitreous detachment. Okay, and most of the time, we're supposed to leave it alone. Just yep. ignore it, you'll yep. get used to it. That's right, that's exactly right. Just like we ignore our nose. If we paid attention to it, it would bug us, or the rim of our glasses, but our brain learns to filter it out like non-useful information. All right. That's very interesting. 81-year-old uh, woman had, that, that's the, the question. Woman from Gettysburg had surgery to drain fluid from a previous glaucoma. Am I a candidate for the shunt? Yes, actually. Um, you know, there's a, it's not for sure that she would be a candidate. Of course, you need a good thorough eye exam. But we have used this uh, device in people that have had laser before or had other glaucoma procedures with success. Okay, so um, draining fluid from previous glaucoma. I, I was also wondering, uh, when you have trouble with that episcleral uh, membrane that you described that can occur sometimes after the separation of the vitreous from the back, mm -hmm. does that, um, how often is that needed? How often do you have an epiretinal membrane when the gel separates? Right. It's a fairly common reason for retinal surgery, and we see it a lot, and it's not bad enough that it needs surgery, but sometimes it does, and we've got great retinal surgeons in town that do, do a real good work, and it's really kind of like peeling tissue pa wet tissue paper off, a very thin wet tissue paper off a very thin sensitive surface. So it's a sensitive surgery. It is a sensitive surgery. We have a question via email. I have low pressure of 10 to 11 in both eyes, but field of vision continues to decline. Why is that? Low pressure, that, that's another story, isn't it? That's a tough problem because our treatments work best when people's pressure are high. So it's easier to get a high pressure normal than it is to take a normal pressure and get it even lower. So she has normal tension glaucoma. And that's a, a real challenge to treat. And sometimes medications will help. 
an eye surgery may be warranted, and it's one of the things that we hope that our medical device will, will really help fill an unmet need for is um, to help people that have normal tension glaucoma. Okay. 73 year old woman from Sioux Falls, is there any new technology for macular degeneration? Yeah, so let's talk about macular degeneration. What is macular degeneration? Yeah, I think that we've got a picture uh, here somewhere. Yeah. Let's see, where is that? Uh, macular degeneration looks like this. So right here is your optic nerve. And all of this kind of reddish orange is the retina. And the macular degeneration are these little spots that you, you see here. And that's because this area of your eye is called your macula. That's and the center of and vision. And that's the center of vision. And so it's kind of the opposite of glaucoma in terms of symptoms. Glaucoma, you lose your peripheral vision. Macular degeneration, you lose your central vision. Okay. There's two types, wet and dry. Um, wet used to be really, really debilitating until there was an invention of a medication that gets injected into the eye that's a anti-VEGF inhibitor, something like Lucentis or Avastin. These cause the blood vessels that are leaking and building up fluid, yeah. causes them to shrivel up and that wet macular degeneration can go away. So that was one of the most important inventions in ophthalmology over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, what percentage of macular degeneration yeah. is wet? Yeah, maybe 10%, 15%, mm. something like that. Um, where dry macular degeneration is more common, usually not that bad, but sometimes it can get bad enough where people lose central vision and there's not a lot of good treatments for it. You can't undo dry macular degeneration. However, there are vitamin supplements that have been well studied. Um, they're called AREDS vitamins. You can ask your any drugstore. And um, things like uh, Occuvite is a popular one. Pressure Vision is a popular one. They all do mostly the same things. Talk to your pharmacist and that can help prevent it from getting worse, but it can't undo it. A 73-year-old woman from Sioux Falls, is there any new technology? Oh, we asked that. 83-year-old woman from Sioux Falls, granddaughter gets headaches and dizziness, nausea. Would prisms in her glasses help? What do you think of the prisms? Yeah, idea? so that's a fascinating question and a really interesting one. There is a South Dakota optometrist here, um, Jeff Kroll, who invented a pair of glasses that have a variable prism in them. And, um, and it is just becoming popularized, and we have seen some dramatic effects from that. And usually you can tell very quickly if it's gonna work. So the answer to that question is yes, and it's, it's worth a shot, especially when other things haven't worked. And do you have any quick answer on how to describe how they work? Yeah. Um, a prism is something that when you shine light into it, it bends. Since I was a physics major, I can't wait to draw a prism. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, we're gonna go here, and we empty that. Okay, Great. Now draw a prism. Yeah, so you have a prism like this, okay? And light comes in, and that light gets bent. And, and that's what a prism does. Now, if your eyes have a hard time focusing together, you can put a prism in there and get them to focus together. What Dr. Kroll invented was something where this prism is variable. And so by the amount you put your eyes together, you get more effective prism or less effective prism. And that can cause so your eyes don't have to fight so much, and that may be the cause of the headache. For the headaches. I, I know that uh, we had a neurologist, Carol Miles, who uh, described being part of that experiment. Yeah, and she's working on she's that one of the experts in it for migraine headaches. Sixty-nine-year-old man from Sioux Falls. What would it cause a fibrous type image in the field of vision? He believes it's in the vitreous fluid. Yeah, it probably is. It's probably a type of floater. And so when that that's that fork in that's the right. jello. That's right. It's fork in the jello, and depending on the shape of the fork, it can make it look a little bit fibrous. Okay. <laughs> Via email, I have flashes of light way to the left and right and see arches of light. The doctor says it's nothing. Darn doctors, ah, you're fine. My retina is fine. In a dark room, I see this cascading or flashes. Is there more to the story? I'm a 65-year-old woman. Yeah. So <coughs> I'm glad that you've seen an eye doctor because the first thing that I would say is go see an eye doctor. Make sure it's not a retinal detachment. Okay? And if they looked well in the periphery, then very likely it's not. And if you see a new explosion of flashes or floaters, get seen again. Yeah. Now, 
oftentimes there's not a retinal issue there. And sometimes migraine headaches can give you that flashes. Give you flashes of light, especially both on the same side. But sometimes you don't get a headache with it, and we call that an ocular migraine, especially if it lasts only 20 minutes to maybe an hour or so and then goes away, then it's probably an ocular migraine. And I would say as an internist, I've seen a million people who come in with some subtle little finding or so, and you examine them and everything's normal. And your answer is, at this point, I don't know what it is. I don't think it's significant or dangerous or serious, but keep me informed. Now, I mean, your doctor should have said that if he didn't say that or she didn't say that. You know, the idea is sometimes it takes a little while for that problem to manifest it, itself enough so, as, so that we can define it. That's right. So you, um, you, know, you come back and say, it's getting worse, doctor. Yeah. Let that person re-examine. Uh, sometimes there's a point where you don't feel the communication is good, get another opinion. Yeah. You, would you agree with that? 100% agree. Um, via email, I can have pain on the top of my eyeballs where I rub my eyes. Is this normal 64-year-old person? Don't rub your eyes. <laughs> Okay, don't rub your eyes. And not just because, hey, doc, my shoulder hurts when I do this. <laughs> don't yeah. do that. It, because rubbing your eyes is bad for you. And if, think of it, think of your eyes kind of like um, a, a basketball that maybe has some weak spots in it. And if you kept on putting pressure on it, you could create a bulge, and we call that keratoconus. And so, um, one, don't rub your eyes. It's only going to make the problem worse. And if you find that you really have this desire to rub, go in and see your eye doctor because it could be that you have um, dryness up there or it could be a condition called SLK where you have some inflammation up underneath your upper eyelids and you can get really significant relief. relief. Don't rub them. Don't rub your eye and there could be something up underneath there. 81-year-old man from Rapid City. We got a bunch of questions, a limited amount of time. Can you talk about Fuchs eye disease? Yeah, Fuchs, Fuchs dystrophy. Fuchs corneal dystrophy, very common condition. Well, pretty common condition. The treatment for it is an endothelial transplant. My dad had it. I did corneal transplants on my dad. Oh, we use a very thin corneal transplant called a DMEC. And after the surgery, you can get spectacular vision back oftentimes to 2020. Wow. 85-year-old uh, woman from Sioux Falls, I have glaucoma for a while. The pressure was kept down by meds. It's doing well. I get sharp pains in my left eye sometimes, but Doc says it's just dry eyes. How can one eye be dry and not the other? Yeah, uh, it can be dry and not the other, and it could be that the tear fluid is draining more or you're not making tears as well, and we've got treatments for all of it. Um, there's some drugs that can be used. Uh, Restasis and Zydra are, are two drugs that can be used. We can put a plug in that helps keep tears around, or we can do eyelid massage to help you make better tears. But that's not rubbing your eyes. That is not rubbing your okay. eyes. 86-year-old woman from Brandon, when she wakes up, one eyelid won't open for five minutes, then it opens, and what's that? I don't know for sure. She's got crust or junk that's yeah, filling yeah, her eye. Yeah, probably, it's probably dryness, or she has a little bit of what we call nocturnal lag ophthalmos, where your eye doesn't close all the way. And then it dries out, and then mucus builds up, and then it sticks together. So a couple of tips. Don't sleep under a ceiling fan. Use a humidifier in your room. Maybe try a thick artificial tear gel when you at go to bed time. at night. Can you buy that over the counter? Over the counter. What is that called? Something like Genteel Gel. Okay. Looks like we're, we're out of time here. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. Pick the best answer. With glaucoma, A, central vision is diminished. B, peripheral vision is diminished. The answer is B, peripheral vision is diminished. It was Gerald Stanley who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Gerald, for participating. And a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. All around town, from stores to playgrounds, babies are on the move. And there are diseases that are on the move, too. And some of these spread easily. To best protect him from 14 serious diseases by the time he turns two years old, vaccinate him according to the recommended schedule so he can go on about his business and you can have peace of mind. For more reasons to vaccinate, talk to your child's doctor or go to cdc.gov forward slash vaccines. The first hint that I had glaucoma came when I was at the eye doctor and it was discovered by machine testing that I had lost vision in the peripheral areas around, but not including the central point of vision on my left eye. 
Loss of peripheral vision is a sign that glaucoma might be occurring, and indeed, when they measured the pressure within my eyes, it was increased on the left. I had no idea something was wrong. An estimated three million people in the U.S. have glaucoma. One half have no idea they have it, and 120,000 are blind as a result. Glaucoma is the second leading cause of blindness in the world, especially for those coming from African origins. Once discovered, we have treatment, so the best preventive move is to get routine glaucoma testing. Glaucoma causes peripheral vision loss and preserves the central vision until late in the disease. Central vision is that concentrated view we have of the object at which we are staring. It is the eye of the needle into which we are trying to put that thread, the subtle smile of the mysterious woman about which we are painting, the target into which we are aiming our arrow. Say it again, early on, central vision is preserved in glaucoma. Remember, glaucoma causes progressive loss of peripheral vision. Peripheral vision is important, allowing us to see the shooting star that flashes suddenly from the eastern horizon while we're staring at the Big Dipper and the northern star. To see the ball and boy that might be jetting out behind that car while we're driving down the road. To see the guy across the room who has captured our attention while we're secretly watching him with peripheral vision. For comparison, Macular degeneration causes the opposite kind of loss to that of glaucoma, specifically loss of central vision while preserving peripheral vision. Both conditions affect the retina, that blanket of nerves covering the back side of the eye which, like a camera, captures the image of an autumn moon rising on a South Dakota lake, a wind wave of grass moving on a prairie hill, or the surprised face of discovery on a visiting grandchild. Take home message, people don't realize there's peripheral vision loss resulting from glaucoma until the damage has been done. Get in to have a routine eye test. You may have no idea something is wrong. We didn't get to all the questions. You can see this, though. We're going to continue this discussion on at on call. With, uh, we're at prairiedoc.org. So go there, watch the end of this discussion, so we can make sure you got all the questions answered. A big thank you to our guest, yeah, John really Burdall. Thank you so much. His willingness to volunteer to come to the studio and be part of this discussion tonight is sincerely appreciated. Our show works in large part because of the guest doctors who each week travel to our studio to share their knowledge freely so that we can help you at home be better healthcare users. We are slipping into another flu season here in the Midwest. Prevention is the key, avoid the worst. Do not delay, get your flu vaccine now to reduce your chances of catching the flu bug. That does it for tonight from all of us here on On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc After Hours. We had really many great questions submitted beyond what we could answer during the broadcast portion of our show, so let's get started. 82-year-old woman, John, from Brookings. I'm due to have surgery for glaucoma. They said it's a little bubble. What does that mean? You're probably having a trabeculectomy. 
And a trabeculectomy is where there's a hole that's created from the inside of the eye to the outside of the eye underneath what's called the conjunctiva. That creates a little blister where that fluid flows to, and they probably called that a bubble. And um, that helps lower your eye pressure and diffuse the fluid so it can get reabsorbed by the body while lowering your eye pressure. Okay, so there will be a little bubble, a little, little swelling yeah, in her right. eyeball. Uh, kind of usually on the top, underneath the upper eyelid. Okay, and people don't notice it's not a problem. No, not usually. 79-year-old woman from Aberdeen got some super glue in his eye. Her eye already has glaucoma and the glue didn't help. What should be doing about this? So super glue, that happens. It does happen and usually we just leave it until it falls off and usually there's no long-term sequela from that. Oh, really? Really. So it didn't hurt though, I mean, what didn't help, but. No, it, it didn't help, but, but it probably didn't hurt either. Yeah, and it probably had nothing to do with the glaucoma and wouldn't Correct. have made it any better or worse. Correct. You ever use super glue in any of the procedures? I know we're doing that for uh, repairing lacerations, sometimes using yeah. super glue. We use uh, something like super glue. If a person has what we call a corneal melt or a corneal perforation, We'll put a little glue on there to temporarily hold the form of the eye until we can do a more definitive procedure like a cornea transplant. 70-year-old oh. woman from, or man from Alcester has a condition called asteroides hyalosis, which is calcium deposits on the back of the eye and was diagnosed at last screening. Was told it was a rare condition, is wondering what the treatment is. Asteroides hyalosis, yeah. calcium deposits. Yep, asteroid hyalosis is a uh, is calcium deposits right in the vitreous, right back in the gel like we were talking about. And it's fascinating. It looks kind of like space invaders. When you look in there, right. you see all these little calcium deposits. Right. Doesn't cause any problems and people don't even notice it. And you would think I've got all of this stuff in my eye, I would notice all these shadows. You don't because the light comes and hits it and it bounces back out the front as opposed to the, the floaters that you get from the fork in the jello that we yeah. talked about earlier, right. that light gets through there and it still gets scattered on the retina. So most people with asteroid hyalosis don't even know that they have it, but it looks dramatic when we look inside their eye. Or you see it. That's right. But it's scary for the eye doctor, but it, is, it doesn't harm Correct. the patient. Well, that's very interesting. I didn't know about that. Yeah. I learned these things. <laughs> Uh, I'm an 84-year-old woman who had cataract surgery in July, followed by a corneal transplant in August, necessitating prednisone eye drops for both procedures. Apparently, these drops may have to be continued indefinitely. What are the odds they'll cause glaucoma? My mother lived past the age of 103 and did not have glaucoma. So 84-year-old woman, she had a corneal transplant. She's on prednisone drops. She's worried about the side effects of the, the prednisolone. If you're not predisposed to glaucoma, it's probably 10% or less of people that have high eye pressure just from the steroids. If you were predisposed to glaucoma, it's north of 30%. Oh, that's interesting. So most of the time it doesn't cause a problem. Most of the time it doesn't cause a problem, even if you have glaucoma. So uh, reasonably safe to take prednisolone yep. eye drops. Via email, our teenage son was diagnosed with pigment dispersion syndrome. He had laser surgery to allow drainage and release pressure. Is there evidence that he'll be at risk in the future? So what is, what is pigment dispersion syndrome? What did the laser surgery do and uh, will he be at risk? Pigment dispersion syndrome, if I had a favorite type of glaucoma, it's that this one. It because a lot of times you can fix it. And why it happens is because the iris is bowed backwards. And when it's bowed backwards, it rubs against the lens and the little zonules that hold the lens and that releases this pigment. That pigment clogs up the drain and your eye pressure goes up. If you use a laser to put a little hole in the iris, that normalizes the position and the pigment doesn't get released anymore and it's one of the few types of glaucoma that sometimes can be cured. Now you may have to take drops to keep your pressure down for a while until all that pigment gets absorbed, but if you prevent it from being released, you may prevent the glaucoma from getting worse over time and you don't have to do anything. 
So you just drill a little hole in the iris peer over several spots. That's then... right. We usually don't say drill. We gently place yeah. <laughs> a little hole in the iris with a laser. Okay. And then that normalizes right. it and it doesn't release the Very good. tissue. Well, that looks like the last question, John. We appreciate so much your being here. Thank this you. is really fun. This has been great. And, uh, and thank you for joining us at our website. We appreciate all your questions, the opportunities to answer them. So until next time, from all of us at On Call with the Prairie Doc, stay healthy out there, people. Eat it. It's good for you and tastes marvelous. Oat Cuisine for good health. Next time, On Call with the Prairie Doc. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota State Medical Association, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care, Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Regional Health, and Swift Health Communication.